Hi, everyone. We're having a bit of technical difficulty here uh, of an interesting sort. Apparently, my speakers decided to just break now. So what I'm going to do is get the show started uh, from this computer that controls it, although since I won't be able to hear anyone else, I'm going to mute this one and, and like literally walk next door and join Georgia. So I'm going to bring them back. I don't know what they'll be saying <laughs> for the next few minutes, uh, but I'm going to head over, and then we'll get the show started. So sorry about that. We'll just take a minute. Okay. Hi, everybody. This will be one of the more interesting episodes of Learning Space. Yes, Mac Nicole has now gone silent. Wow. Uh, she's just going to pop over to my office, which is not too far away at all. Um, but we are getting ready to talk with Mike Simmons about Global Astronomy Month. And as soon as we kind of get organized here and rearranged slightly, we will Why proceed the with the show. Why okay, Nicole. I, I have to ask why Nicole can't use that TARDIS in her office to do that. I know, right? <laughs> just be able to move over. Wouldn't that be fantastic? Yeah, okay. Um, all right, so hold on. We want you to kind of... So can you, you, can you bring the Q&A up, up on here? Mm -hmm. Yeah, all right. Okay. So I'm not um, at my usual station, which means I'm not controlling... I don't know if you want to come oh, closer. That's fine. Mike is the star of the show, not me. <laughs> oh, good. Put it all on me now. Yes, you can put it all on you. Hi, everyone. Welcome oh. to this just disjointed learning space. <laughs> I'm Nicole Gallucci here in Georgia Bracey's office because my computer decided to freak out about a minute before we went live. It was loud and interesting. It made a really horrible noise, and it's probably because I was messing around with this, the sound, so I'm going to have to just reboot it and start again. But I didn't want to send you all chasing new links, and so we're just going to roll with it as it is. Um, so, yeah. yeah. So we have with us today oh, Mike Simmons from Astronomers <laughs> Without Borders. Uh, we're going to be talking about Global Astronomy Month. You guys can, can uh, use the Q&A app to interact with us as usual. Send us your questions and comments through the Q&A app. Again, because I'm not at my station, we're not, we don't have anything else open at the moment. <laughs> so, so please try that, although I have, um, oh, you have that open we've too? got the event page also yeah. open, but, but we'll, it just might be a little awkward. Q&A app is the best, um, it's the easiest way to do it. They've really done a good job integrating it to the YouTube stuff, so yeah. pretty yeah. yeah. So um, one thing I wanted to show you guys, and since I ran next door, I don't have it with me. Um, I, I said I'd talk about a Make a Constellation activity, and, and there's a PDF I'll link to in the show notes when we're done. Um, but it's it's a common activity I've seen done a bunch of ways. And the the version that I'll be sharing with you guys, it's a um, you give your students this you know sheet of paper with dots on it in a certain pattern. Uh, this one picks a particular pattern from the sky, picks this, the constellation Cassiopeia, and asks them to draw what they think it is. So draw a picture around it. And so some examples might be a butterfly or a bird, and not necessarily going to see a queen sitting on a throne from the <laughs> side, uh, the way it is traditionally pictured. Um, another way I've done this is um, when I was with Dark Skies Bright Kids, we'd get half sheets of black construction paper and just go to town with a hole punch randomly on you know many 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 sheets uh, and give these out and uh, see and give them out with um, colored crayons like colored crayons and ask them to uh, draw what they see there's a certain perfect age for this activity it's kind of like later middle school mm -hmm. early junior high where they latch onto it and go yeah if they're too young they may not get what you're trying to get at without further explanation if they're too old, they may think they're too cool for it, um, depending on, on, on the setting. Yeah. Um, but that's a really fun one, and I've, like we were saying, we've, we've had examples that we hung on to. Yeah, I did it with fifth graders, um, and like Nicole, I thought that was the perfect age yeah. from, for all the reasons Nicole just said. Um, and it's a great way to talk about why we have constellations in one sense, that people looked up in the sky and noticed patterns and then created stories and named them according to what was important to them and what was meaningful to them and what entertained them. So I can only imagine, it's been years since I've done this activity, but um, I can imagine, you know, the cell phone, you know, the smartphone constellation or, because I used to get even, you know, years and years ago, lots of fun stuff that was just, you know, the TV, the robot, the, the yeah. different things that we don't have up there now, but that are really cool. And Harry the Platypus like. was my favorite. Yeah, so it is a, it's a great activity. Yeah. Easy to do and lots of fun. Yeah, so I'll, I'll post that link at the end, but like I said, the, the uh, make a constellation or do make your own constellation is kind of a 
been done and redone a few times. <laughs> you go, you find a version that you like. Uh, looking at the comments, uh, Nancy Graziano says it's sad she won't be able to see the occultation of Regulus by Aragon. There's a in Jersey. So Jersey is one of the few places that will be able to see this occultation. I think it's happened, scheduled to happen tonight of uh, a small asteroid passing in front of the bright star Regulus. So that bright star will blink out for you guys if you don't have rain. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, East Coast. Uh, and you know, wants to wondering why we always sit in separate offices even though we're next to each other. It's just easier to control the computer when there's one person in front of it. But it's mine, true. Mine just freaked out and needs some love. So, <laughs> so let us know oh, if right. there's any. Um, let us know in the Q and A comments if there's any particular problems with what you're seeing because uh, I'm not driving. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of hard to tell. I'm kind of <laughs> you know, driving from the back seat. I don't know, uh, something like that. So a little weird. All right, so let's get yeah, to our start. main topic. April is Global Astronomy Month, and uh, mm -hmm. this is. Global Astronomy Month 2014. We have Mike Simmons here from Astronomers Without Borders to tell you about a bunch of the different programs and, and things and stuff and ways you can celebrate um, uh, Global Astronomy Month. And I'm curious, Mike, how long has Global Astronomy Month been going on? Oh, well, <clears throat> the first one was 2010. Mm -hmm. And it was a follow-up to the 100 Hours of Astronomy Cornerstone Project in 2009, the International Year of Astronomy. And I led that, and we had you know, we know somewhere between a half a million and a million people look through telescopes in one night. Uh, ESO did a, this uh, webcast for 24 hours from 80 observatories around the world. There was just a lot of cool stuff. And we, we had all this community and all this buy-in, and people loved it. And, and I just, we couldn't just drop it, you know. So we just did this. It just spurred the moment. I didn't even want to announce anything until 2009 was over because we had IYA. And so he just said, hey, we're going to do this. And the first idea was to me, have the global star party for 24 hours and just whittle it down to that and focus on that because that 100 hour, four days just about killed us all. <laughs> and then somebody said, uh, no, no, we got, you don't want to do less. You want to make it a whole month. And <laughs> when, when, when I was reawakened after fainting, uh, <laughs> yeah. you know, it was it was a good argument because we can bring in more things and while we don't have that one unbelievable moment the same way we did in, in IYA with all of IYA going on I mean it was it was great but we have so many programs and so many different things and they can happen at different times and if you get clouded out one night you can do something another night and you know things like that so it's worked out really well and just about kills us every year but <laughs> we keep doing it because I, I don't know why. Just, <laughs> has it, it's, has it's it grown? Thing. Has it kept growing, I guess I should ask, or have you... It, it has. It one month, sort of, and, and that's it. Yeah, well, no, no, it's not going anymore. It's, uh, no, uh, not not with me. Month, We're not getting months. global astronomy year every year. It's not. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah, yeah, we would die. Boggles the mind. And, and uh, you know, but the thing is we can bring in all these different programs, all these different things you couldn't possibly do in four days. And yeah, it's more work, but we, it, it's sort of like when everybody gets together, you know, why stick with one thing? I mean, you got a chance to do all these different things and bring in more different types of community, education, artists, and, and just all sorts of different things. So um, it's turned out to be uh, really fantastic, and uh, hopefully in the future it will continue to grow, not time-wise, <laughs> but uh, in other ways. Sure, yeah, definitely. So what um, what kinds of activity? What are the highlighted activities of Global Astronomy Month? What do you think are the big the big the big hits? Well, um, to me, of course, observing is always important. And you know, astronomers without borders, the the idea is bring to get bring people together through our common interest in astronomy. And the International Year did a lot of that, but um, that's that's astronomers without borders mission. And when we're looking at the sky, we're all seeing the same sky, okay, it's southern or northern, but you know, a lot of the times we're looking at the moon and it might be rising here and it's setting somewhere else and we're just doing the same things and a lot of that observing has to do with, especially um, in uh, most of the world, um, is public outreach. So you have people that are doing public star parties um, and showing these same things to people everywhere. 
and it's just it's just really cool to be doing what we always do, but be doing it with people on the other side of the world. Um, you know, the moon. We, they may be looking at the moon from the southern hemisphere, where it looks upside down. It looks upside and, down. Uh, us. <laughs> you know, who knows what? So. <clears throat> Uh, it, it's a way to share what we're doing uh, with each other. It's like being part of a, a much bigger astronomy club. So the Global Star Party is on April 5th, and let me, i got to check the schedule so I, I get these dates right. But they're all listed on the on the website, and April 5th is sort of the big one for that. Um, that's a Saturday, right? That's a Saturday. Yeah, because yeah. seven days later is Yuri's night. That's the only reason I know that. Oh, very good. <laughs> what is Sunday? You, uh, Saturday, the next Saturday is Yuri's night. Oh, yeah, right. Well, that's always the 12th, and it happens yeah. to be the Saturday this time, yeah. It's Saturday, okay. And uh, we, we've got other things. Um, w now, we have a lot of, uh, we're going to have a lot more stuff. There's still stuff being added to the program now. <clears throat> so there will be new news, more news. All news is new, I guess, but more <laughs> news coming out all the time <clears throat> and about other things. And one of the things that, that we're going to concentrate on more is Mars. And Mars is, uh, you know, observationally, it's yeah. very exciting for the public. Uh, it's less exciting for amateur astronomers because you don't see as much as you do yeah. Saturn and Jupiter and so on. And this is, a, this is an average opposition. But it does come to opposition during April, and every time it does, the media goes crazy saying it's going to be as large as the full moon and all that stuff that we keep hearing. I thought that was every August. Yeah, Even well, if Mars isn't in the sky, it's going to be as big as the full moon. It's right, right, right. <laughs> yeah. And so, uh, but this year we, we are partnering with Uwingu, um, the organization that's raising funds for planetary research and, and other programs uh, in outreach and education. And uh, we're going to have a special programs for that. Uh, associated with their Mars uh, crater naming project, um, which everybody seems to be happy with, except half of the astronomy world. But Something <laughs> like that. <laughs> yeah, it's a little controversial, but uh, but we'll have some good things going with that. It'll engage everybody, raise funds for it, and won't step on anybody's toes very much. So we have a lot more to announce there. Cool. So uh, how can people get involved in the Global Star Party? Are there local sites? Um, that are that are uh, doing their own star party and everyone's linked together. There, you know. It, so what it is, and uh, and then I'll I'll describe a couple other observing things too. And there's a lot more to talk about. But as far as the global star party and other things like Mars Watch, yeah. people can go onto our website and register uh, events. And uh, I just discovered there are a couple kinks there. Mm -hmm. It must, must be associated. It's some Nicole's computer probably messed it up. It, yeah, just play my speakers. Oh, yes. It's fine. <laughs> yeah. And uh, but you can register your events there, and it's set so that you have to register. You have to register just to make sure you're not a, a spam bot or something. Mm -hmm. And then people can see what you're doing. It goes on a world map of events. This is just open, so there are only a few on there so far. Um, so other people in the area can find it, you, but you can also share with other people. And um, after the event is over. You, you can create a certificate that says that you've uh, organized an event. And we're also going to have, um, we, we have for all members, membership is free, though we'd like people to take supporting memberships because that's not free and it helps support what we do. But we don't rule out anybody. So you can join free and everybody gets a blog that they can post their results. And then you can share those with everybody else. So it's, it's one event. But it's happening local and locally in a lot of places, and of course at different times. So uh, if you're watching Mars, uh, even at opposition, it's up all night, but it's not up during the day. So mm -hmm. these are all local events that we do together. And so now, uh, I have to sign up our star party to do another event yeah. for April fifth. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> duh. Right on campus, so I should totally do that. Mm, absolutely. <laughs> We've had a lot of cloudy nights, so the students actually, uh, the high school students, need to make up some time. That's actually well, good. you know, it isn't just uh, observing events or successful observing events. You know, we we have uh, Sunday, which we're going to have a special uh, webcast that we're going to do from Mount Wilson Observatory inside of one of the solar telescopes, a historic one that I show the public, you know, lucky public once in a while, um, and, and you can see the whole 
huge pit spectrograph and the telescope and everything is sort of inside of the telescope. And so that's going to be a special one, and we'll focus on the sun then. So for people that are that are only up during the daytime, and uh, uh, Vesta Watch and various other things. We'll also have a tweet up this year. We haven't done this before, but people can uh, tweet uh, and and tweet some pictures of what they're doing and share with everybody. So you can follow the the stream and just see, see stuff coming in from all over. Again, it's offset by time. But uh, it's going to make a great collection of, of images from, from everywhere. Everybody's doing the same thing, but it looks totally different. I'll share some pictures and give you the idea if, if we have time. But uh, it, it's really kind of fantastic to see all this happening. That's great. Um, and we also have uh, online programs. So we'll have a special one for Mars, of course, and uh, Vesta and some other things. These are run by uh, Gianluca Massi in Italy, who's a very cool astrophysicist who does his own uh, online programs, and he gets massive amounts of uh, participation. And it's sort of like this with the with the chat box, and everybody's um, talking to each other, but they're from all over the world. And uh, he does a great job of, of bringing objects into everybody's home, and has done all kinds of things. And he kicks off the month on uh, let's see, make sure yeah, April first by doing a Messier Marathon. Ooh, so right at the <laughs> Yeah, and, and you can pop into it any time, and if you're if he's in Italy and I'm on the west coast of the U.S., so I can join him during the daytime, and he's the only one that has to stay up all night. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> it's, it's just great fun. So, you know, those are the types of observing things that, that we have. Very cool, very cool. Are there any, um, so Mars is going to be the opposition, are there any other special astronomical events happening during April that you're focusing on? Well, we uh, Vesta is coming to opposition too, and okay. it's a good one to spot with binoculars, and, and sometimes I think you can see it naked eye if you're in a really, really dark place and not staring at a computer screen. Mm -hmm. uh, you'll be able to see it. Um, and that's right around the same time as a total lunar eclipse also, which is, and I can't even remember now where that's happening. But we'll try and get some cameras on that um, so that we can share that with people all over, whether it's uh, uh, daytime or nighttime cloudy or, or whatever it is. And uh, <clears throat> yeah, and uh, there is also, uh, let me check when this is. Yeah, there is an annular solar eclipse on April 29th. Oh, OK. Probably only be observed yeah, by penguins. Because it's going to be in Antarctica. Oh, no. so, <laughs> yeah. So far, we haven't found a penguin with a web accessible telescope to bring that to us. Is that so, close enough to the South Pole Station or anything like that? Yeah, no, it's not that far south. So, but that is visible. That is going to be visible as a partial over uh, Australia and some of Southeast Asia. Okay. Yeah, so that that's another good astronomical event, but not as good an outreach opportunity for yeah, us. Here. What a way to end the month, though! Wow. Yeah, it is very <laughs> cool. So it's that's you know a rundown of some of the observing type activities uh, to get out your telescope and and share what's going on with the public, and if you don't have one or if you don't have a clear sky, uh, get online and and join in the fun with the virtual telescope as well. Great. You have a central place where people are going to be sharing uh, pictures or even, I don't know, a blog or comments and things. You mentioned like the tweet up and things that are going on with specific activities, but for the whole month, is you going to collect it all somewhere? <coughs> well, it's all on, on the website and we have sort of a GAM Global Astronomy Month subsite on the website. You can reach directly uh, at GAM uh, hyphen AWB it's for Global Astronomy Month hyphen Astronomers Up Orders and nobody wants to type that out. <laughs> uh, .org, or just Astronomers Without Borders .org, and, and there's a, a link on the front. Now we've just had a website change and mm -hmm. it looks absolutely fantastic and now we're fixing everything. It got broken when we did that so um, I mean, it works great. We have new capabilities, but the main capability I wanted to get, uh, which we're still working on, is getting all the blogs and all the galleries and the pictures and everything someplace 
so that if you go to a page that says this is the Global Star Party, um, stuff shows up there, and you can pick and choose what you want to see. So everybody's it makes it easier for everybody to share because the idea is to be a worldwide community. Right. And we've had people participate in up to 150 countries uh, at different times, and so it is about community. It's really about sharing what we do, all in all the different ways we do astronomy. Observing just is, you know. For old hardcore observers like me, that's what I think of. But um, though I enjoy now sitting in a nice, warm, comfortable room <laughs> at, a, at a time when I'm not falling asleep and watching it sometimes. So what um, what kind of responses and impacts has Global Astronomy Month um, gotten in the past? From, from the last few years of doing it, maybe do you have a favorite moment or um, some measure of, of impact across the world? Oh, we're always scrambling so much. I'm afraid we haven't done a good job of, of uh, measuring impact. Um, and I'd have to go back to the statistics to see. But you know, we at any at any gam there there's always over a hundred um, countries participating. And I can't remember the the measures we have for the number of clubs or number of events participating. Um, we're always sort of scrambling, unfortunately, and. Uh, Going back to 100 hours of astronomy, where we spent over a, over a year preparing for that, we had 2,400 events wow. uh, registered around the world for this one night. And we know there are other places where people are registering because it was a big worldwide event. So there had to have been at least 5,000 events going on. Wow. Um, so, yeah, I'm afraid um, we haven't done as good a job as we should have with metrics. I'll see if I can find something <laughs> from previous years while I'm looking. We we do have it, but uh, yeah. not off any, the any particular anecdotes, maybe? Anecdotes. Really enjoy uh, doing. That's a good question. I'm always too busy. Yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I know the feeling. <laughs> um, I, you know, just very cool things. When I see everything that's going on around the world, it's it's just so awesome. There are just so many, um, so many different events that to me they're they're all cool. And you see something come in from some country that you, you know, barely heard of, and and uh, or find astronomy that's going on in some war torn country. Um, the, you know, there's a very active club in Kabul in Afghanistan that does a lot of work, and and. Uh, in Baghdad and, and northern Iraq and um, many other places. Uh, to me, one country I go to a lot, it was really started my international astronomy stuff, what, chasing an eclipse in 1999, 15 years ago, is Iran. And that country is probably the most active I know of, of, of any country per capita with the number of clubs and the outreach they're doing. And one of the things we find too is that it's it's almost entirely young people in most countries, instead of mostly old old guys like me uh, who've been doing this for a long time. And it's uh, very much a uh, very high majority of women participating in, in astronomy there. So uh, this is uh, this is you know some of the things you learn that's so cool when you get connected through something that's so familiar and so common, and then realize people are. Uh, are uh, you know different than you expected? It's a it's a learning experience for which is good for learning space, right? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so uh, we have a question. I can't read. It's too far away. From Brunel Woodson, mm -hmm. uh, what astronomical event happening this year are you most excited for? Well, let's see. For me personally, I haven't looked beyond <laughs> April. There is on May first. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. Relaxing on May first. <laughs> I hope so. Yeah, I'll probably get drunk in stupor someplace. Um, so there is a an eclipse, an annular eclipse later on in the year, and I um, I believe no, that's next year. Okay. What are the big events this year? You know, there are the usuals with the great um, uh, meteor showers. Of course, the Perseids and the uh, Leonids and the Lyrids during Global Astronomy Month. We have a Lyrid watch where um, you know we have tips and things about what people can do for that. But we don't have a transit of Venus or a total eclipse or anything like that happening this year. So I, 
I'm stumped. I haven't been looking at it. What do you guys think? <laughs> I'm waiting for 2015 for uh, Dawn to get to Ceres and New Horizons mm -hmm. to get to Pluto. That's Gosh. my, that's oh, my yeah. astronomy event. Yeah. Absolutely. But, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I don't, I'm kind of with you. I, I don't have a sense of anything really bigger than usual happening yet this year. I kind of go <laughs> almost not even month to month, but week to week, really. Yeah, I, just, I, like, I, do, I do start party every other week. I just look at what's ahead. Yes, <laughs> what's happening tomorrow? Yeah. <laughs> That's about it. Yeah. Um, but, you know, you that. joked about relaxing, and honestly, what I look forward to every year is the chance to get out in better weather and really just lay down in the backyard under the stars and just look up and be amazed by it all, honestly. And then, hey, if there's a meteor, that's great. If the ISS is going by, yay. Or, you know, you never know. You get surprised by interesting things when you just spend time looking. So, honestly, yeah. that's that's what I'm hoping for. I, I, I agree. <laughs> to me, it's a rare event these days to get out under the stars. Yeah. I don't get to do as much as actual astronomy as before. But when I do go outside, I live in the mountains, and it's an okay sky, and uh, just it's like uh, getting together with old friends. You know, they they yeah. come around once a year and visit, and I've been we've been getting together for more years than I want to think about. <laughs> so it's always it's always good. And I can mention some of the other things that that go on during Global Astronomy Month as well. Um, but uh, you know, I just noticed that. Uh, Nancy Graziano asked an interesting question, which is sort of, you now it's, it's a follow-up to what you asked about the impact. Where do you see GAM and its influence in five years and in ten years? And, you know, the thing is that Astronomers Without Borders is really new. I mean, we're very much in startup uh, mode. <clears throat> and we, we've just grown so fast because we've done global things that other people haven't done, and there's a demand for it, and it was just accepted way beyond I ever what I ever imagined. And I, I would say the main reason that Global Astronomy Month isn't bigger now is because we just haven't had the resources resources to keep up with demand. It's, it's uh, you know, and we're, we're raising funds now, and, and I'll, I'll do a, a commercial pitch here sooner or later, but, um, and we're hiring on more people, and that's allowing us to get a lot more done, because it's just really a huge amount of coordinating. Mm -hmm takes place. And we should be starting on GAM 2015 on May 1st, maybe May 2nd, right. <laughs> get a break for, you know, and we, we just haven't really been able to quite keep up with it. So where do I see it in five years? Well, by then, we're going to have our act together. Uh, we've gotten good support, and I think we'll be in good shape then and be able to work on it all of the time. Mm -hmm. Whether or not it'll ever have the really enormous impact of the International Year of Astronomy, I don't know. But you know, that's the kind of thing that I would like to see. When everybody came together, it was it was phenomenal. And I would hope that that within five years, and certainly uh, within ten, that it's something that everybody knows about and everybody looks forward to and has their events scheduled for. As a, as a way to bring astronomy to the whole world to show its not only its importance, but to give everybody uh, an opportunity. You see, nowhere, everywhere I go, and I go to a lot of different countries, and I've been doing this for a lot of years, 40 years or so doing public outreach, there isn't anybody that's not interest, that, that isn't interested in astronomy. And, you know, it's a familiar story. I loved it when I was a kid, or I still follow the, the news from here and there. And, you know, you know what it's like? It, it, you get together with people that have questions about the latest news, about what happened in the first trillionth of a trillionth of a trillionth of a second of the Big Bang, you know? And uh, so it's uh, th that's what I hope for, most of all, is that it's sort of the world's celebration and a chance to really get together and look up at the sky together, and the idea is, you know, we're, we're, we share the same sky. We're all on this planet that's surrounded by stars. We are actually on this ship traveling through space together, and we look upwards, we see that's where we are. You know, we've got a front window in one direction and the rear window in the other direction, but we're all on this one little speck here, moving, moving along together. I feel like there's a, a nice Earth Day connection you can make there, because that's kind of the idea behind Earth Day, is we're all on this one globe together. 
Exactly. We're talking about this. We're all in this globe, but we're all looking out. Yeah, and you know, one of the things too of, of the many things that we're involved in and that I, I get involved in is uh, the Overview Institute, with, which is an organization that's using the overview effect from the uh, book by the same name uh, by Frank White, who interviewed astronauts, who not all of whom, but some, many of whom had this this different world view, literally world view, seeing the Earth uh, in space, not looking down and seeing no borders, but seeing the Earth as an object in space among the stars. Mm -hmm. And and I've I've talked to Frank and others about that, and said, you know, astronomy is the overview effect for the rest of us. We're not going to get into space to see this view for ourselves. And in the same way, you know, you look at the moon and you see Mars beyond it, and you can visualize with the knowledge you have of Mars being farther away. That third dimension in the solar system, you can see how things are moving. Mars is moving so much slower and so on. And, you know, when you look up at the sky and realize this is this is where we are and the person on the other side of the earth he's looking at the stars just from a different angle it's not different stars different sky he's just in a different part of this this thing we're traveling on it happens to be around so um yeah. that's that's what i would like it to bring to everybody is this sense of uh, humanity traveling together very carl sagan-esque and and now Tyson esque, I guess. <laughs> I think that's heightened um, <clears throat> if you are at a dark side where you can see the Milky Way, and that's something a lot of people don't necessarily have access to. Right. Um, when you get a clear view of the Milky Way, that really brings that out. Um, well, then you see in the whole galaxy, I mean, it, and when you visualize this, it's not just, you know, we know now it's not a crystalline sphere with lights shining through from something behind it. Um, Unless you happen to have a giant crystalline sphere at your house with holes in it and like that, but and so when you look at it, you realize you're looking out at the galaxy that yeah. we're in. So now you can visualize where the Earth is headed, not just that it's spinning around, not just that it's going around the sun, but where the sun is taking us, and and those are our fellow solar systems out there with uh, mm -hmm. potentially habitable planets. You can think. visualize yourself in the disk. You yeah. know, when you when you have that really good mm -hmm. view, and maybe this is more from the southern hemisphere, where you can actually see the bulge in the middle, and you you you, you get that three dimensional perspective, and it's like, wow. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> but a lot of people like don't have access to that, um, which is which is really unfortunate. And I, I noticed um you have Globe at Night listed as one of the because that's going on every month uh, now, this yeah, year. It's going on, yeah, it's going on all the time. So. It's a it's a sort of a the GAM campaign for Globe at Night, but there's a whole Dark Skies Awareness Program, uh, International Dark Skies Week has mm. set for April now, and that's run by Inter International Dark Sky Association, and um, and there are some other things that are still being brought into that as well. The International um, Earth and Sky Photo Contest, which is mm. both Dark Skies Awareness and the World at Night, TWAN, mm. which creates pictures of, of the sorts of things you're talking about. <clears throat> but here's the thing, you know it's called Dark Skies Awareness because most people aren't aware of it. People look at pictures of the Milky Way and I've had people write in and say, why do you make the sky look like that? That's not what it looks like. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry, yeah. but you know, most people in this country live in uh, cities and they don't see it and they have never seen it. Mm -hmm. And they don't understand what people are talking about when they say let's bring back the night sky. And why would you care? Well, I, you know, we got 10 stars. What do you want, 20? Um, yeah. Now we want billions and billions. And those people who have seen the Milky Way grew up in a dark sky have some understanding of that. So this is, it's only the last 100 years that people have been cut off mm -hmm. by this whole half of our environment in the night sky because of electric lights. Um, so it's, um, it, it is really, really a shame. And uh, astronomy is in every culture. You think of how many things have star names or planet names or something. If you're good, you get a gold star. I mean, it, it, it's everywhere. Yeah. And it's, uh, but people, now it's abstract. 
people mm -hmm. don't really understand it. So that's, I think, extremely important. And there's more information now that it really affects us um, emotionally, physically, uh, as well as the natural world. It's, yeah. um, it's not. It's supposed to be dark at night. <laughs> and it's actually dark. Oh, dark. Really dark. Um, we, yeah. <laughs> in addition to, to lights, uh, we, we also have a comment from Jeff Setzer pointing out that uh, one of the challenges for Global Astronomy Month in the U.S. is that it's April, and that there's a lot of snow, rain, and cold, and clouds across much of the U.S. Um, have you yeah. had uh, more weather? He says, uh, I know much of the world is good weather at this point. I never thought of that. Like, yeah, that, that may be an, uh, a particular North American thing, <coughs> ugly spring. Well. Yeah, it depends. I mean, it can be a challenge. Well, it can be a challenge almost anywhere. Um, and people ask, well, why do you do it in April? Why don't you do it during the summer? And then I have to ask, which summer do you want, northern hemisphere yeah. or southern hemisphere? So it can't be too far from the vernal or autumnal equinox. And 100 hours of astronomy was in uh, early April for that reason, and that's why we continued it in April. Um, it is unfortunately, unfortunate there are some countries that um, it's not the best time. And that includes a good part of the U.S. and a good part of Canada, you know, from North America. It's a good time for some other places. Mm -hmm. You know, even on, in uh, tropical countries, they have rainy seasons and less rainy seasons. Mm -hmm. So it's, um, we, but if we did it in the summer in the north, then it would be winter in the south. And yeah. you know, so we really sort of have two choices. And it'd be great if we could have it a different time every year, but then it's no. not. And it <laughs> that gets a lot of work there. Yeah. yeah, no, that'd be impossible. So it's, uh, it, it, yeah, it's a problem. But, you know, now, unlike 100 Hours of Astronomy, we have so many things that people can do um, online, with right. the online viewing, uh, connecting with other people, just... With the tweet up, if you're watching, you'll be able to see what other people are doing as well. And some clubs with a special webcast or a hangout, we're going to do a lot more hangouts um, uh, this year with people from different countries. You can actually bring them online and say, so what are you guys doing now? And we'll hang out together and start have a star party together. So um, Sometimes clubs will plan a, a, a meeting or event around something that's online, too. Uh, you can present that to the public. They're not going to know about it otherwise. Right. Mm -hmm. It's a great opportunity for them. Um, Unfortunately, it's the whole month, like you say, and you have activities that are not necessarily based on going out and observing, right? You've talked a lot about those, and those are the kind that you relate to, but I know you've got things that you know, encompass music and poetry and art, of course, and photography. So do um, you want to mention any of those others that if you're... <laughs> yes, I'm still here. Sorry. <laughs> no, wait, no, come on. Um, off the talk about some of the other, yeah, ones that um, bring in those other aspects of stars and astronomy. Well, that's really important, and, and you know, and as I said, I, I've always been an observer. I'm, I'm the guy that's out there in the winter with the biggest telescope I can find at 3 o'clock in the morning trying to find some 16th magnitude galaxy <laughs> or something. You know, I don't do too much of that anymore and because it's too uncomfortable, but uh, I still do that some. But there's so much more that's come in, and that's one of the most gratifying things about Astronomers Without Borders is because... People have come in to use the platform. Uh, either we act as an umbrella organization for some other great uh, programs which are related to education, using astronomy as what I call it the gateway drug to, this, yes, to the yes. sciences. Because no matter where you are, you have the night sky. And uh, and so you know it's, it can be used. And we've done some things in Africa where that has been shown to be really, really effective. Uh, where places where they don't have any labs in the schools, but they have one up, you know, up above. Um, and arts has been one that I've been aware of, but not to this extent. And we have an artist, uh, Daniela De Paulus. She's Italian, lives in the Netherlands now, and, and works with a big uh, radio telescope there to do art um, uh, performances, really, uh, live doing moon bounce, which is sending images to the moon and having them reflected off and pick them up in another place. 
But she's brought in just all kinds of space artists, and this is a new universe for me because we have this ongoing program of space art, space performances of one kind or another. Um, some, some people work with uh, uh, JPL on, on uh, spacecraft. Uh, others are doing, you know, they're really purely art, but they're using some sort of celestial theme. Um, science, you know, old science fiction or even new science fiction uh, magazine cover art and, and things like that. And it's just uh, enormous and it's fascinating. <clears throat> it's, it, it just goes to show what I said. Here is a whole community of people who you think of as something else entirely. And their focus is the same thing that we're doing. We're just looking from completely opposite sides. And um, so that's a very active program. There will be a lot of hangouts uh, with uh, uh, artists doing things. We have two concerts. One in particular, the Cosmic Concert. This is uh, Giovanni Renzo, Renzo, I think it is. Sorry, I hope I got it right. Uh, in Italy, he's a composer. He writes a new piece for Global Astronomy Month every year. And he performs that live in front of a background uh, a screen of incredible images from the world at night and time lapses and other things. So it's a, always a unique uh, original performance that he does every year. And, and there are other things like that. And this, it's, it's uh, yeah, it, you, I'm kind of <laughs> awed by the whole thing and, yes, and yes. how that all works. And uh, let's see, so... They did, uh, when I was in um, <clears throat> Santiago before the um, inauguration of the Atacama Large Millimeter Array, they had a small public opening at a, um, oh gosh, it was a subway station. They made an exhibit in the subway station about mm -hmm. Alma and about radio astronomy, and the opening of it, they had uh, this woman, the soprano, do this... It was, a, it was a newly composed opera, and she, like, had, like, an Alma dish thing on her head, and <laughs> was this bright, it's, she was all shiny, like a big telescope, and they had these pictures going behind her, and she was singing, and it, was, it wasn't even words, it was just singing to uh, go along with the imagery, the radio astronomy imagery they had in the background. It completely blew me away. <laughs> so that's the kind of thing I think of. It's just, that is a completely alien world to me, too. <laughs> I am, a, you know, by no means an artist, and it's, it's amazing. Yeah, and isn't it interesting how somehow what people come up with in terms of music or art, even if it's abstract or something else, yeah. fits with the feelings we have. Right. It, it, mm -hmm. it made emotional sense to me. It totally did. Yeah, because we don't do astronomy just because it's cool science. That's enough of a reason, but astronomy is not like a lot of other sciences, especially with all the amateur astronomers. You don't have as many amateur microbiologists or nuclear physicists. <laughs> but people are passionate about it and they get into it. And there are ways of touching that passion mm -hmm. it, that that's what that's what artists do. I'm really I wish I was there. It gives me goosebumps thinking. Oh, yeah, <laughs> and it, and it, yeah, and I, I've been hoping to find a recording of it because they were like, please no recordings. This is a mm -hmm. brand new original work. So I, I need to track that down now. It's been a year. Sounds amazing. Um, yeah. Kind of tied into that uh, idea, I think. Um, so Pernell Wils Woodson asked uh, when we were talking about um, the dark skies, do you think some people are afraid to think about how vast the universe actually is? Yeah. Yeah, this is a – This is a, it's hard to talk for uh, for other people. My own feeling is, yeah, I think so. I, I Different types of personalities. Um, you know, some of us like the wide open spaces, like I've been used to in Southern California my whole life, and other people just don't feel comfortable. Uh, you know, they prefer to have a forested hills and, and so on. And I, I don't know if that's related. I really haven't run into that. I think the people that might feel that way aren't going to come up and ask me questions about how vast the galaxy. So maybe it's a biased sample, but um, yeah, I, I don't really know. If, uh, I, I would imagine so, but I'm only guessing. What do you guys yeah. think? Um, I was a city girl growing up, so the first time I was out under a dark sky where I could actually see the Milky Way in the middle of nowhere in Pennsylvania, it was a little terrifying because, <laughs> oh gosh, there are critters. 
But um, the the view of the Milky Way was never terrified. That was that was mind blowing in another way. Right. Yeah. Being out well, in the open, I could I could see that being an issue. Yeah, and it, and uh, certainly dark darkness is not something we're used to now. Yeah. In China, where I'm working with some people on new um, dark skies uh, reserves and parks, mm -hmm. uh, and there is a a nascent uh, dark skies awareness uh, movement. They don't call it dark skies. They call it starry skies. Okay. Darkness is bad, and, mm -hmm. and cities show how good they are by putting as much lighting as they possibly can. Mm -hmm. And so they can't say dark. So mm -hmm. they say, well, you go out where the stars shine, not where it's dark. And certainly a lot of people are uncomfortable with that. And uh, I just happen to love it. It's a, it's a different world. I go out um, at night. And I live in the hills, so we have wildlife. Uh, most of which I like. It's I can't see the mountain lions at night, so that that's a little concerning. But yeah. um, and it, and it's just different. But you know, I have a tendency towards that. When it's here, here's here's a good anecdote or thing about me. So I I tend when it's at night, I just tend not to remember to even turn on lights when I walk into a room, mm -hmm. which my wife thinks is kind of hilarious, especially when I bump into something or trip over something. <laughs> during the daytime, so, That's but it's natural for me, and, and I happen to love it, yeah. Yeah, I noticed when, as students come up to the observing site, just last, yeah, last night, you know, they're like, they've got their cell phone glow, they're living by the cell phone glow, because they can't do anything without any kind, I'm like, no, put it away, seriously, you will appreciate it. Well, like <laughs> yeah, really, and you listen and you notice the animals that are out at night, and you know other things. At night is just a different time, and it's half of our existence. Yeah, and so, sometimes if you, uh, I was like, just give it a chance. If you turn off the lights, you know, by the time you're dark adapted, you know, all of a sudden you realize, hey, it's not as dark out wow. here as I thought it was going to be. I mean, I've had a lot of people experience that, and it's just a lot of people don't give it a chance. You know, they're afraid well, to, or, yeah. you know, don't think to turn off the lights and just sit there in the dark. Because it takes a few minutes, but, mm -hmm. you know, it's amazing. Yeah. You can see. If you turn on the porch light at night, you're only going to see the porch. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. As a kid growing up in Staten Island, I wanted to, like, just destroy everyone's porch lights. <laughs> it was bad. Yeah. Um, so there are God, there's so many questions in here. Can we go for three hours here? What a great audience. Sure. No, See, I, I, I were worried about yeah, one I hour. <laughs> well, like Tatiana, Tatiana asked the question. Comment yeah. by uh, Tatiana. Oh gosh. Fa sorry. Vasilevska. Thank you. Like I, mine, your name's Golucci. I'm just as bad. Uh, I like. Yeah. Well, I, I had to work on that though. I have to say I studied it before you. <laughs> okay. Came. So but Tatiana will let us know if we got that right. Exactly. And, and that's an important thing, too. Uingo is very much in the news, and I assume that's what she means by the Mars Project. And the answer is yes. Um, the controversy is kind of a non-controversy. There really isn't any conflict here. Uh, just some, you know, some issues raised that I don't really think is are issues. And, and, and that'll... that'll They'll go away eventually. And I'm actually writing a piece for, because we're participating in, in writing a piece in support of it and looking at all the angles that I'll be publishing within the next few days too. So that would be my view. I also, I like the comment about uh, in Ireland, it's never a good time. <laughs> Cloud and rain is such <laughs> a common thing that when the sun comes out, it's actually a big shock. Uh, and I've heard similar things. Yeah, everybody yeah. runs outside to see what's going on and they run back inside because it's too bright. Yeah, what is that? <laughs> <laughs> kind of like grad students. Turn it off. <laughs> yeah, so there are people that are afraid of the light, I guess. But yeah, but astronomy, you know, astronomy is active in Ireland. I know people in Ireland. There's a lot that happens there. Astro art, um, I know somebody who's known as Sky Sketcher and uh, Deidre Callahan. She does a lot of educational things and won awards. Yeah. Yes, and they do uh, art stuff. Yeah. yeah. I noticed that uh, in the Netherlands, there are a lot of radio astronomers, and I wonder if that has something to do with the fact that they don't have a lot of clear skies, but they have a really strong radio astronomy program because <laughs> yeah, clouds, no big deal. Yeah, I think if you want to find a, a Dutch uh, observational, a uh, visual observational astronomer, you should look in Chile. The Chile. <laughs> yeah, that's where they are. Somewhere else. Oh, it's right. so true. Yeah. Uh, 
Gosh, we're getting, yeah, you're right. We're getting so many good comments. Um, oh, it's, this is fantastic. So um, there were some others that I saw here. And oh, Jeff Sensor said something... this one a while ago I, I wanted to point out. was uh, Sepida Reaching for the Stars. Oh, I know about that. Yeah, it's, it's a documentary that gives a glimpse of astronomy outreach in Iran. So that's yeah, um, and I haven't seen the whole movie yet, but but I helped a little bit with that. The thing is, there is this town in Iran, mm -hmm. and um, and I've been there several times and taken other people there, and it's devoted to astronomy. And talk about uh, observational people getting behind it. There's here's here's a great story. So the first time I was there, this town they were building an observatory and. They were raising money to do this, and this is all started by a teacher. He's passionate about this. He would take the kids out at night to do star parties and so on. Rural, conservative, like every place, and the, the boys and girls usually wouldn't be together at some sort of event like this, but for astronomy, it's okay. Uh, astronomy is, um, uh, you know, it's and especially with what he did. So they're raising money for the observatory. Women are selling their jewelry to raise money for it. And uh, this is the town Sepide, uh lives in. And um, she uh, first went there about the time she was born, I guess. <clears throat> but so the first time I was there, I said, boy, this town is, you know, it, and Friday prayers um, uh, in the mosque, they, they're in between things. They have slideshows in astronomy, and they announce the big event so the whole town can come out. I said, so what about the lighting in the town, a town of 10,000? It's not a lot. You know, and I meant, is it sky-friendly lighting? Do they shield everything? <clears throat> he gave me a different answer, which was better. He said, oh, the light's no problem when we have a, a, a big star party. We tell the, the city government, and they turn the electricity off. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> it's an amateur astronomer's said, dream. Wow. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I haven't been able to make that happen in Los Angeles. Right. <laughs> nope. <laughs> This is a place where I said, you know, what do the people say? And they said, well, they don't know. It, you know, power goes out all the time anyway. Oh, wow. Right. Yeah. So that's wonderful. So Sepi Day uh, lives in this town. She's absolutely passionate. I've seen only clips of it, but uh, I was in contact with the person making that. And uh, Nushan Sari is on our board of directors. Uh, first Iranian in space, uh, uh, first uh, private woman explorer in space. And... Um, sponsor of the Ansari X Prize, the first privately funded uh, space vehicle, um, and and she is this girl's um, hero. And I think they, I don't know if it's in there. I know they spoke by phone. It's Saw very touching. Trailer. Yeah, she got to talk to her. And it's apparently, you know, everything I've seen and everything I heard, it's a great um, a film. Very interesting culturally, but yeah, it does show the passion of astronomy and how it can overcome just about anything, really. Mm -hmm. uh, Pernell Woodson also asked, will there be any public lectures during Global Astronomy Month? Okay. <clears throat> uh, first, before I, I answer that, mm -hmm. I want to mention that uh, Tatiana said, yeah, I, I got it right. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> she doesn't mind anyway, but apparently she's used to being Miss France, but uh, it was close enough. I have Russian friends, so I... <laughs> um, public lectures, you know, we don't have anything that's a, a lecture per se. Mm -hmm. um, I tend to try and avoid just talking heads. Um, the, the, you know, our three heads here were talking about cool mm -hmm. stuff, but it's not just a one-way thing, and, right. and interacting with your great audience is awesome. Um, but we do have hangouts for the astro arts that should be very interesting. We will have things where there's questions and answers. Um, but not an astronomy lecture per se. Uh, that's something that, you know, maybe we'll do something more like that, but I, I tend to want to do things others aren't doing. CosmoQuest and Universe Today, and you guys are doing that kind of stuff already. We, we don't need to try and repeat that. So, uh, but we could work together yeah. and bring some of your programs in and Definitely. vice versa. Yeah. Yeah, I wanted to address, we were getting a bunch of questions about uh, the Big Bang and gravitational waves, which we're not going to cover in this Hangout right now. Uh, but you should come back on Friday for the Weekly Space Hangout, right. because the, we will be talking about that story. Matthew mm -hmm. Francis, uh, Dr. Matthew, Matthew Francis will be talking about that story. He's a cosmologist. Uh, and so we can bring those, que bring those questions to that Hangout, and I will make sure they get up there. <laughs> 
We no. will not have any programs observing gravitational waves during. No, unfortunately. <laughs> So, and there are a couple of comments in there too about the the um, first experience of uh, seeing the Milky Way uh, from uh, Michael Meyer uh, on Sark, which is a dark island. I think they have a new uh, official dark sky reserve there, and uh, somebody else had that. He's mentioned it before in other hangouts. I can't find it now, but. Uh, I uh, mentioned it. Oh, that's uh, Nancy Graziano again, who uh, saw the Milky Way for the first time a few years ago in Montana. Their daughter, and at 54 years old, you know, and a lot of people never ever see it. You know, I want to mention something else. This is something that's not on our site at all yet, but there's a new, um, there's a project that's being done by somebody who is doing a, a PhD thesis. I don't know if this is related to her thesis or not, but it's an awesome. Program. It's called Sky Scrolls, and she is collecting stories from people about how viewing the sky has affected their lives. Mm -hmm. And that, just like looking at Saturn for the first time, or Jupiter and seeing its moons like Galileo did for the first time 400 years ago, these are really life changing experiences. I mean, it, it, you know, it sounds like it's overdoing it, but suddenly. You look through a telescope for the first time, it's like having lived your whole life with a fence around your house, and one day you get up and you peek over the fence, and, and there's the rest of the world there. And so it, it makes you a part of the universe. Uh, you just really feel a part. You're seeing it for yourself. You look up in the sky, you see this bright thing, and you say, wow, that's, that's Jupiter. Mm -hmm. And seeing the Milky Way for the first time, I think it's the same sort of thing. We, we walk around with these blinders on at night all the time called cell phones or street lights mm -hmm. or whatever it is. And we're not aware of what's around us. It's like somebody's, some, if, you know, imagine the daytime. If, you, if somebody covered up everything that's around you, you couldn't see anything except the one street you were going down. Um, so seeing the Milky Way for the first time and realizing your place in the universe and, and where we are, it, it, it's a, you know, it's, it changes your sense of self, really, most often, if you're open to it. Um, and, you know, it gets towards the meaning of life and why we're here and everything else, which are things we can't answer, but, you know, make some relevant questions. I, it can be a, a, an amazing experience. So we are work both Dyke Skies Awareness and Astro Arts want this uh, project, Sky Scrolls. We had a meeting with the person doing it who's in Qatar, and uh, we're going to bring it into GAM somehow and, and give it some um, awareness. It's a big part of what we do in GAM. It just make things, uh, give them a higher platform, things that are worthwhile, you know, so people know about it. And I can't wait to see the results of that. It's just uh, going to be some amazing stories from all around the world. Do you have any pictures that you want to share um, before we wrap up? I know you've got some pictures. Well, I always have pictures. These are, <laughs> I've shown some of these before, too. Um, and let me see. Well, let's see how I can do this. Because, you know, as usual, it's trying to get things ready yeah. at the very last second. But and I broke that's no good. <laughs> that's fine. That's yeah. <laughs> So I put my yeah put this on the on the other screen on the other monitor and when I turned on the slideshow it it uh, covered you guys up so I can't see what I'm doing so um, I'll just do it in in PowerPoint here and just show a few yeah, things I, yeah I've never figured out how to get the full screen to quite work yeah mm, let's see screen sharing where's screen sharing now oh, there it is okay. Okay, so everybody will see my whole uh, there we can. My whole thing there, but that's okay. And there we are. Okay, so there are some pictures up there. So, and these are old pictures. You know, I've got a bunch of newer ones. So I apologize to those who might have seen these twelve times, but they're still good. These are from hundred hours of astronomy, and we, you know, we made an effort and we had the ability to collect pictures from all over. But it really it doesn't matter because it it doesn't change from one year to another. So this is, uh, in fact, a telescope that I took with me to Iraq in seven years ago or something like that. Uh, this is the Kurdish uh, region, the, Kurd the Iraqi Kurdistan up in the north, and uh, 
someone taking a look through the telescope that was brought over that was made available by uh, amateur astronomers here to, to use there. And an old uh, traditional gentleman, a, uh, and in Baghdad, where they came out for the event uh, and had a crowd of people, even though it was very, very dangerous then. Mm -hmm. But they just were insistent on it. So, and, and here, and this is, you know, this, like I said, this is 100 hours of astronomy, but these are some youngsters taking part in that uh, event in Bangladesh. Yeah, that's a great sure. <laughs> And this one, I can never remember which country this is. Islamic, obviously. It looks like uh, Eastern Asia to me, uh, Indonesia or something. But, you know, if you notice, she has stars on her uh, coat. Yes, look at that. And um, this, this, could, this is a picture that could be taken anywhere. It happens to be in Kathmandu, in Nepal, and in India. You start seeing these things look all the same. Yeah. You know, the telescope looks the same. Well, hunched over a telescope. <laughs> yeah, and this is in Iran. And uh, here, this shows that everybody gets into the action at Star oh, Party. that's right. <laughs> this one is Brazil. This one is uh, Bolivia. And, yeah, same telescope that, that, yeah. that we had in Iraq there, but the clothes are all different. And this is this is a teachable moment in, in <laughs> In the Munich, and I always like to embarrass my German friends with this, but you know, who knows? I mean, this is new stuff to everybody, and that's what makes it so cool. And and that one there, that just it doesn't make any difference where that is. It's an H alpha telescope. This happens to be in Romania, which is a very very active too. But people do this everywhere, and that's that's why we do it. I mean, what what better payoff can there be than that? Yeah, that wow moment. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Happens all the time, so uh, I've, I've got more, but you know, I never haven't prepared them all. Um, oh yeah, and so we got a uh, Michael uh, Joven here has been doing uh, sidewalk astronomy uh, in the inner city. Yes. Everybody yeah. takes a look, and uh, you know, these are great remarks. You got you got a wonderful audience. We do. Our audience yes. is awesome. It's fabulous. <laughs> you guys rock. Oh, and somebody put in the link for Sepa Day. Yeah, there you go. So there's, there's the YouTube oh, link. Oh, you I wondered about that. Excellent. That. I wondered if you could still again. see that. I've known about this happening for years. Oh, and a trailer. Yeah. Okay. Never seen oh, it's it. on iTunes yeah. for seven ninety nine. Good. I will go there. Excellent. Here we go. Oh, thank you, Jeff. Yeah, I'm going to have to get All that right. too now. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Very cool. Oh, yeah. You guys so, are awesome. No kidding. Uh, let's see. How can the average person contribute to GAM? Um, oh, there we go. Yeah. Yeah, that's from Nancy again, and that it's um, you know contributing is participating. Uh, other than organizing an event, uh, which is not for everybody, absolutely, I would not recommend it to anybody that isn't half crazy but overcome by passion for doing this kind of thing. And uh, how can you contribute to it? Well. Participating in an event uh, anywhere if you can find it, whether it's online or anything else, and, and if you join, you can can contribute your contribution. We'll have a forum reopening up. Uh, we, like I said, we've got more community things coming that I fervently hope are all ready in the next 10 days so we can make use of them there. Um, and if looking for any kind of a way to contribute, well, there's always donations. Um, and uh, that that's a great need. We're really in a building year right now, and I'll, I'd like to mention too uh, that we have a store. Um, we have a telescope. <clears throat> this is the main thing I would mention that has gotten an unbelievable review in Sky and Telescope. It's sourced for us by Celestron. Celestron's a major partner, and I say partner because they're not just a sponsor, but they actually source for us it from Sintin in China a telescope that they they purchase in quantities, ship it over, store it, and ship it out for us, all of their cost. And so we sell this telescope for far less than it is available in other countries from other companies and um, get a huge chunk of it. And it's an awesome telescope, very high quality. You can look it up in Sky and Telescope. I think it was November. No, I'm not, I can't remember which issue it was, late last year. And um, so that's available there for $199. It's a 
great beginner's telescope. And the thing about it is it's Dobsonian. It's very compact, 5-inch, and it's collapsible. It's all backward, it's too. Backward. <laughs> We're just looking it's now. It's very popular. Great. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and it, the fact is we can't keep it in stock since yeah. then. Yeah. So we've had more on the water on, on the way here, and that will probably be sold out before they get here. So um, we also have some other things for more advanced amateurs and some educational things. We're adding things all the time. So uh, anything you purchase there helps us out. And then there it is. <laughs> I'll try to. It's kind of frozen. There we go. So yeah. I can't talk and navigate on my computer at the same time. Oh gosh, uh, I, I'm not even on my own computer. I have no idea what's happening. <laughs> She's doing no. great. Thank you. But yeah, there, there's, 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 there it is. There it is. Yeah. So it's a tabletop five inch, and that open tube part it slides down. Okay. So, okay. Yeah. I was wondering how that worked. Yeah, and cool. and it stands about 14 inches tall or something. And you can grab it by that built-in handle there and pick it up and take it away. Nice. Um, I, I met one person who has an eight-year-old uh, girl who takes it out, sets it up, and observes with it. So that's great. Uh, and it's good quality, not not the um, you know typical department store stuff. Yeah, that. Celestron makes good stuff. Let's be honest. <laughs> yeah. And we this have is one good. In our department. So um, so there's that, and we also have supporting memberships mm -hmm. and um, lots of different ways, but. You know, as far as contributing to GAM itself, it's participation, it's community. If you take part, you're contributing, as far as I'm concerned, making events better by, by being there. Cool. All right, well, Excellent. I think we are going to finish up with a few announcements. We want to see you again, Mike. You, you're, and you're, you know what? I forget this every time. That We're still screen sharing, yeah. <laughs> I'm still that screen kid's sharing. awesome, but we want to see you <laughs> for the last bit. Somebody is supposed to tell me that. Uh, <laughs> well, that Kim is awesome. It's good. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, I just wanted to wrap up with a few announcements and then we'll part with one last word about uh, Global Astronomy Month. Uh, like I mentioned, Friday is the Weekly Space Hangout. We will be talking about all kinds of news. We have two weeks to catch up on. Uh, so Matthew Francis has put at the top of the spreadsheet, he put, <laughs> he put that story about uh, gravitational wings gravitational waves as a mark of inflation. Uh, he has some really good things to say about it. Um, maybe a little bit more tempered than some of the other stories you've been reading, but it's, it's really exciting news. Um, I'll be bringing the news of the CosmoQuest Moon Mappers paper that has got published uh, recently, and so we'll bring that. Um, and whatever other news stories we decide are fit to talk about. Uh, so that's tomorrow at noon Pacific um, here on Google Hangouts, usually coming from Fraser's page. Uh, Sunday night's a virtual star party. Fraser and Scott host that. And they have their uh, amateur astronomers hooking up their telescopes to to um, the Google Plus the uh, Google Hangout live streams. You can actually see through their telescopes in the comfort of your home. And this is depending on what time zone you're in, right before, or right after Cosmos in the U.S. So uh, mm -hmm. it's it's a whole Sunday night of astronomy. Uh, I'll be live tweeting mm -hmm. Cosmos again probably uh, this Sunday night. So. Uh, Join us for that. Um, Monday is Astronomy Cast at noon Pacific again, assuming things don't break uh, this week. So they'll be doing uh, Fraser and Pamela will be doing Astronomy Cast Tuesday morning U.S. time. There's a special new hangout we're adding. Uh, it's actually Pamela is hosting the hangouts for the Google Lunar X Prize group. Uh, so they will be doing that on Tuesday morning. So look in the newsletter that I'm sending out tonight or on Google Plus for that. Uh, and then Wednesday is learning space again, and we're talking about microbes in space next week. All right. <laughs> microbes in space. So yes. it's very exciting. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All the gross Excellent. citizen science. So, <laughs> yes. Um, thank you, Mike. Uh, do you have any last parting thoughts for our audience uh, about Global Astronomy Month? Oh, I just say go there, oh. check out the program schedule, pick some things, write to us if you want to, if you have comments or ideas. I don't know, after an hour, I can't think of anything more to say about it. So. <laughs> I don't believe you. I just really, <laughs> I have to go next door to actually turn the thing off. So. <laughs> Bye, Mike. Okay. All right. Running next door. Running okay. next door. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Right. She says good night. Good night, everybody. And again, yeah, thanks to the audience. You guys are so fantastic. Really appreciate yeah. your comments. And, and Mike, thank you very much. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure, it's and fun, thanks for, for sure. Cool and all the great things. comments and so on. And uh, I sometimes take part in the um, hangouts, uh, virtual star party. Usually not the weekly space hangout unless I have some news to talk about. So, 
Okay. Maybe I'll see some people there too. Yep, plenty to choose from. All right, so thanks everybody. <laughs> thanks Nicole. Thanks Mike. We'll see you next week. Bye bye. Bye.